Hello everyone, this is Dennis, and you are on the Den Electro channel. Today we will make such a small switching power supply with a power of 36 watts. This power supply produces 24 volts and is designed for continuous operation with a maximum current of 1.5 amps. The power supply is assembled using a flyback topology using a top 233Y chip operating at a frequency of 132 kilohertz. The advantages of this power supply are its simple circuit and small number of parts. It also has a number of protections, overload, short circuit, overheating and overvoltage and undervoltage protection. Now I will show you how to assemble it, and then I will test it. The top 233Y chip looks like this. It looks like a transistor. It has five legs, but they are counted from the first to the seventh. The second and sixth legs seem to be missing. The first pin is control. Voltage is supplied here from the control winding. The third is multifunction. It can be used to organize a number of functions that are used in these power supplies, but I will talk about them in the next video. Now this pin serves to protect against high and low mains voltage. The fourth pin, source, is the source of the field effect transistor installed in the microcircuit. The minus is also connected here. The fifth pin is frequency. If you close it with the source pin, then the internal oscillator of the microcircuit will operate at a frequency of 132 kilohertz. And if you close it with the control pin, then the frequency will decrease by half to 66 kilohertz. The seventh pin, drain, is the drain pin of the transistor. Voltage is supplied here from the primary winding of the transformer, and the micro circuit is powered from here. There is a table in the data sheet that shows the micro circuits belonging to this series. Top 232, 233, and 234. They have different powers, but they are all assembled according to the same scheme. At standard mains voltage in a sealed case, the 233Y can be used for power supplies up to 20 watts. If the power supply is without a case with good cooling, then the power increases to 50 watts. If, when creating a power supply, it is designed to operate in a wide voltage range from 85 to 265 volts, then its power will be less. Micro circuits with the index P at the end of the marking are produced in a dip weight package. G in SMD housing. And with the index Y in the TO220 case. This is the most powerful version. Also, only here you can change the frequency, either 66 kHz or 132. Microcircuits in DIP and SMD packages operate only at 132 kHz purity. The power supply circuit looks like this. It works roughly as follows. On the left is an alternating mains voltage of 220 volts. It is fed to a high-frequency filter consisting of capacitors CX1 and a common mode choke L1. Electromagnetic interference fades out here, and the current goes further to the diode bridge, consisting of four one-end 4007 diodes. After this, the rectified mains voltage is smoothed out by capacitor C1. The current is supplied to the primary winding of transformer T1 and then to the U1 chip, top 2, 3Y. I marked the output of the microcircuit here with serial numbers and letters indicating the function of this output. When the microcircuit starts up, it will begin to create high-frequency pulses supplied to the primary winding of the transformer. The primary winding of the transformer consists of two semi-windings, each of which has 48 turns. There are two secondary windings. The first winding is power. When current appears in it, it passes through a 5-ampere 100-volt Schottky diode D6 and is then smoothed out by capacitors C5 C6, and a 3.3 micro Henry inductor L1. 
the output of this winding will contain the 24 volt voltage we need. The second secondary winding is control. It consists of seven turns. I would like to note that this winding does not serve to power the microcircuit. For its operation, the microcircuit receives voltage from the primary winding of the transformer. The voltage created on the control winding serves for feedback. It passes through the optocoupler transistor U2 and reaches the first pin of the U1 chip. This chain operates functions against overload, short circuit, auto restart, and skipping pulses, so that the power supply consumes less electricity at idle. Microcircuit U3 is a controlled Zener diode TL431. It controls the stabilization of the output voltage, and with the help of its wiring this voltage can be adjusted. It is formed by a voltage divider consisting of two resistors, R7 and R8. The voltage created by resistors can be calculated using this formula. To make the output voltage more accurate in parallel with resistor R8, I added a 100 kilo ohm resistor R11. This resistor is not necessary. If after assembling the power supply, the output voltage is completely satisfactory to you, then there is no need to install it. And these are the ratings of the remaining parts of the power supply. It seems that there are a lot of details and the diagram is very complicated, but in reality this is not so. If someone doesn't understand something, ask questions in the comments. As usual, I will make the board for the power supply using laser cardboard technology. Just print out the board layout, stick it on a piece of cardboard, and that's it. You can change or adjust something in it at any time. The dimensions of the board are small, 45 by 115 millimeters. All the details are drawn on the top side of the board. In the places where the points are located, using a thick needle you need to make holes for the legs. If the holes do not coincide with the legs of the radio elements, then the holes can always be made in another place. Then you need to insert all the radio elements into the holes and connect them with jumpers on the back side. The transformer will be inserted here. For its thick legs, the holes need to be made a little larger. I will use this core for the power supply. Both halves are the same size and there is no gap between them. This flyback power supply has a single-ended topology, so clearance must be provided. The transformer frame looks like this. Where there are two legs I will consider the low voltage side, and where there are four legs there will be a high voltage side. This is where I'll start winding the windings. First I will wind half of the primary winding of 48 turns. I start winding from the second leg. I bring the wire on the left behind the frame, and out on the right. This produces one turn. I wind all the other 47 turns in the same direction. I managed to lay this amount in exactly two layers. It doesn't really matter how many turns you wind, 40 or 50. The remaining half of the winding can be wound after all the windings. After the rain comes out on the right side, bend it down. I wrap it around the first leg for a while. Then I use mylar tape to create three layers of insulation. Then, starting from the fourth leg, I make a control winding. I also insert the wire from the left behind the frame, bring it out to the right, and make seven turns. Then I lower it down, wrap it around the third leg, and bite it off. Then two layers of insulation, and turn the frame over to the other side. This will be the secondary winding. I start winding the four core output from the left leg. I put it behind the frame on the left and it comes out on the right. In this direction, you need to make 13 turns. I lower the end of the wire down, wrap it around the right leg and bite it off. Then I do three layers of insulation again. I turn the frame back over to the high voltage side. I take the end of the wire that remains hanging on the first leg and wind the second half of the primary winding. 
In the same direction, I wind another 48 turns from left to right. After the rein comes out on the right side, I lower it and wrap it around the first leg. Then, I insulate the outside. This completes all the windings. Now, using a radio component tester, I'll see what the inductance of the primary winding turned out to be. Without the core, it is only 50 micro Henry. And I need an inductance from about 1000 to 1100. And if the core is inserted into the frame, then the inductance will be very large, almost 6000. Then I glued seven layers of tape onto one of the halves. Now there will be a gap between the halves. The inductance of the primary winding will decrease and the core will not go into saturation. The distance between the halves was approximately one-tenth of a millimeter. But still, when designing single cycle transformers, you should always focus not on the gap between the halves, but on the inductance. Having pulled the core halves tightly together with tape, I again checked the inductance. It turned out to be 1120 microhenry. This is a little more than necessary, but such an error will not hurt. When everything is ready, you get such a nice transformer. All wire terminals must be cleaned of varnish, tinned and soldered to the legs. If desired, the halves of the core can be glued together. In the place where the ends of the primary winding come in and out, just in case, put a piece of electrical tape. At this point, the input and output leads of the primary winding are very close to each other and therefore there is a possibility that the insulation of the wire may be broken. After all, between these terminals, there is a rectified mains voltage of more than 300 volts. I made choke L2 from a small ferret dumbbell. You need to make 10 turns of a double wire on it to get an inductance of 3 to 5 micro henries. When all the parts are installed and connected to each other, you get such a cool device that looks no worse than a factory one. In this version of the board, the blue capacitor ended up being very close to the transformer. In essence, there is nothing terrible about this. But in another version of the layout, I will make the distance between them greater. On the reverse side, everything is connected by jumpers. Resistor R11 is also installed here. I will leave a link to the file with the printed circuit board in the description. When you download and open the project, the board will look like this, this is the top view. All radio components are marked in red, and the tracks in green. You can go into each part with two clicks and see its characteristics. First you will need to print the top side, a silk screen printing on which the radio components are depicted and then the bottom side showing all the tracks. But before printing it must be mirrored. This project opens in the Sprint Layout program. A link to it will also be in the description. The first switching should always be done through the safety light. The signal LED on the board lights up, the voltmeter shows 24 volts, the power supply has started up and is working. After this, the power supply needs to work for at least 10 minutes. Then you need to turn it off and feel all the parts. They should be cold. Then you need to connect a small load and let it work in this mode again. This small light bulb consumes about 30 milliamps. When it is connected, the voltage does not drop. This is already good. This power supply has short circuit protection. Let's see how it works. When I short circuit the probes, the voltage drops to zero, and the current begins to periodically jump. 
If the short circuit is eliminated, the power supply returns to normal mode. Now, it's time for the real test. To test the power supply for maximum power I will use an electronic load. I showed how to make it a long time ago in one of the previous videos. Slowly rotating the regulator I increase the load. The voltage has dropped a little, and the current is 1.5 amperes. That works out to about 36 watts. This is exactly the power I was counting on this power supply. By the way, after testing, I came to the conclusion that the radiator installed on the chip is too small. For long-term operation, it is better to use a larger radiator. I'll try to load the power supply even more and see what happens. The power supply also holds a current of 2 amperes perfectly. Power is almost 48 watts. I would like to note that the voltage stabilization is also quite good. There is no significant voltage drop at maximum power. I'll try to load more. Current 2.5 amperes. 60 watt. The load did not rise above this limit and the power supply went into protection. Now, as in the case of a short circuit, the power supply tries to restart every time. When I reduce the load, it returns to normal operation. As you can see, the power supply is very simple. It can be used in everyday life. You can use it to power amplifiers, LED strips, make chargers and other devices from it. That's all for today. Like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Click on the bell so you don't miss new videos. But if someone doesn't understand something, then ask questions in the comments and I'll try to answer them. Bye everyone.